watching West Harper Community Sorry. Television. You're watching West Harper Community Television. You're watching West Harper Community Television. For the community, by the community. Hi, I'm Sarah Connor, and you're watching Life and Style with Sarah. On tonight's show, we're talking about getting published. I have on the set with me two recently published authors, as well as a literary editor and agent. So if you have a manuscript that you're dying to get published, or a book that you're dying to write, stay tuned, because they're going to share with you their experiences and advice on getting published. So I have on the set with me tonight two recently published authors. Um, the first author I have on the set with me is Ellen Painter Dollar, and she's so recently published that she's waiting for her book to arrive. Mm -hmm. She wrote um, the uh, nonfiction memoir, No Easy Choice, a story of disability, parenthood, and faith in an age of advanced reproduction. My second guest is um, Lisa Swain. And she um, has 15 years of experience in the publishing industry as both an agent and an editor. Thanks for joining us. And my third guest is Susan Schoenberger. And you're about a year into the process of having your book out on the shelves. Mm -hmm. um, she wrote this book, A Watershed Year, and this is a fiction novel. Ladies, welcome. Thank you. I feel like I'm in the midst of rock stars because I've been looking <laughs> into how hard it is to get published and it's pretty hard. Lisa, do you want to talk about just sort of industry statistics on how easy or hard it is to get published? It's a very difficult process, although uh, since I this first started, it's gotten a little bit easier because there are more avenues now to do it yourself than there ever have been. Um, so you're talking about with the electronic, electronic, self yeah, self-publishing stuff, kind of and you it, and you can do it more successfully because I think the marketing avenues are there for you, mm -hmm. but uh, but even still, that that arena is crowded as well. I mean, right. it's very very difficult to get your work noticed. I read one blogger say there's a about one to two percent chance of getting published and she said the odds are still better than the lottery but it's it's pretty hard <laughs> so I'm True. in awe of, of you two ladies and maybe you can share with us your story of how long it took from concept to publishing for your book sure uh, well my book is as you said uh, partly a memoir so the events that it covers um, happened back in 2002, 2003. And I first sat down to start writing the book in uh, late 2004. Uh, spent five years basically looking for someone who might be interested in publishing it. And in every case, when I sent it out, I was not sending it blindly. I was sending it to places where I had a pretty decent connection. But even so, um, it was just rejection after rejection. There was one um, particularly heartbreaking one where <laughs> a good friend of mine um, who's a, knew uh, the head of a pretty big uh, publishing company personally. He was a personal friend, and so he recommended me to this guy. This head of this publishing company called me at home said, you know, I've gotten this recommendation. I'm so excited to read your manuscript. I assure you, I'll give it my personal attention. And three days later, I got a forum rejection letter from the editorial assistant. So, uh. um, so that kind of thing happened a lot for five years. And then um, finally in um, 2009, um, I connected with um, an acquisitions editor who was interested in the project. She and I then worked together for a year to refine my book proposal to get it to a state where she felt like her, her publisher's editorial board would accept it. Um, and I got the contract in 2010. And the so book about, just came out um, so about eight last years. week. So yeah. It's like an eight year process. Basically, yeah. Susan, what about you? Um, we have a remarkably similar <laughs> time frame. <laughs> okay. um, I also started writing this manuscript in 2004. Mm -hmm. 
and um, it took me about two and a half years to have a what I thought was a really solid first draft, but um, fiction is a little bit different from nonfiction, so you have to have the manuscript needs to be ready for publication before you can start approaching agents. And one of the things that really helped me was um, winning a contest, which is for unpublished work, which I did in 2006. So it won the, it's, the title's long, it's the William Faulkner William Wisdom Creative Writing Competition. And in winning that contest, I think um, it just gave me a lot of confidence and I felt like I had something really to show to agents. So unfortunately, the agents really didn't feel that way <laughs> for, for quite a while. It took me really another year after that um, querying agents because with fiction, you really, it's very important to be represented by an agent. I'm sure Lisa can speak to that yeah. more. Um, but after that, uh, I, I did get an agent in 2007 and it took us two years to sell the manuscript. Um, I did keep going back to it based on feedback that I got from editors and feedback that I got from other people. Um, because in this business, I, I always tell people, the only thing you can control is, is the project itself. The, sort of the outside reaction to it, you don't really have much say over that. And in some cases, it's just a bit of luck, like having it land on the right desk at the right time. Mm -hmm. So I just kept going back to the work and, and rewriting and trying to refine the manuscript so I felt like it was the best thing that I could present to people. So after that uh, sale in 2009, the book came out in March of last year. So you both have mentioned agents. So how important, Lisa, being an agent, how important is it to have an agent? And if you don't have an agent, what happens? Well. Uh, an agent is important because you need someone to represent your interests. Um, I think an agent is also important because, by and large, you need their Rolodex. Pardon the old-fashioned word, but um, <laughs> you, you need their contacts. Yeah. Um, it is, in the end, a legal transaction, and there's a lot going on there, and you need someone to manage that for you who knows what they're doing. Um, when I was an editor, which is what I did first, we didn't even look at stuff that was unrepresented. That was just straight to the slush room. We, I worked for uh, G.P. Putnam Sons, which is now Putnam Penguin, and uh, we had a 12 by 12 room full of manuscripts that people sent, what we called unsolicited, which means we didn't ask for it, so we don't want it, <laughs> and there it would go, and it would sit there for years sometimes. Wow. I mean, you had to be, you know, the summer intern was probably the only person that ever went in there. <laughs> um, so if you want your stuff read and to land on the right desk at the right time, you need somebody to put it there for you. Um, okay, so an agent, so the first recommendation or piece of advice is an agent is incredibly important. Can I just say one thing though? Yes. I actually didn't have an agent. Oh, um, you didn't. Although, okay, okay, well um, maybe if there's a possibility it, here. <laughs> and, I, and although I, obviously everything Lisa says is absolutely right and I would have liked to have an agent. <laughs> um, I tried to get one and that wasn't okay. working either so I was sort of working to working both at the same time looking for an agent as well as approaching um, editors that were willing to look at unsolicited okay. manuscripts. In my case part of it is the kind of book I was writing. Um, my book does have a, a faith angle. It is written mm -hmm. for a Christian audience and so I was not looking to get published by a big New York agency. I was looking for um, a, a church oriented, Christian oriented, smaller publishing company and they don't necessarily always look, always use agents. They may use agents sometimes. Mm -hmm. So in my case, um, I ended up, I still needed those connections though, mm -hmm. and so I, I ended up um, connecting with my publisher through a number of other connections. Um, but she was an acquisitions editor at, at my publisher. She also then served as the editor for my book. I mean, this is, where a, this is a small operation we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so you needed the connections. I needed the connections. You didn't really and blindly send it in. No, I did yeah. not blindly send you it in. And contact. I'll also say that for my, I hope this is my first of other books, mm -hmm. and I will be finding an agent for any future you projects. Have a much easier time getting and an agent now that I have yeah. a published book, it will be easier. <laughs> right. So what is the sure process of getting an agent? What, how do you, assuming you, it's the best thing to do, although there are anomalies where you can right. do it without it, but assuming that that's really the best way to go about it, how do you? 
get an agent? Where, where, how do you even get to the point where you're ready to have an agent? Well, I can tell you that I thought I was ready to have an agent <laughs> a long time before I was actually ready to have an agent, which is probably yep. true of most people. Yep. They go through the process, they think, oh, the book's ready, I'm, I'm going to start sending it out there. And then they have the experience of getting the really fast rejection that comes almost immediately via <laughs> email saying, you know, I, I'm not the right person to represent your book. Um, and when you start getting numbers of those, uh, you know, it starts to occur to you that maybe your book really isn't quite ready. So um, for me, it took, you know, a few rounds of, of that and also just kind of waiting until I was a little more confident about the book. And then during that year that I searched for an agent, I just sent blind query letters to agents. I really didn't have any connections in that world. And so um, the first time that I actually had lunch with my agent editor in New York, which was like, uh, you know, still remember that as like the greatest moment. Um, they, my editor said, so how did you know Jessica, your agent? And I said, well, I, I didn't know her. I just sent her a, a query mm -hmm. and I told her about my book and she asked for three chapters and then she asked for the full manuscript. And she was shocked that I didn't have, <laughs> that I was just kind of some random person sending, right. sending this letter because there often are connections and ways that people, you know, hear about writers. So. I, I think that I was very fortunate that she was kind of a younger agent looking to build her list and I, you know, she More happened to right really time. like, she happened yeah. to really like the, the manuscript when she read it. So, you know, that's part of the random nature of the business mm -hmm. is just kind of hoping that you connect with the right person. But it is very intimidating. You have to do a lot of research. You have to really look, I, I know you could probably speak to the ways that authors find oh, agents sure. who represent the work that they might be interested mm -hmm. in. Now what, how yeah. is, are there certain agents for certain types of books? There or? are actually. Um, and what I tend to tell people to do is, uh, it's actually very easy to do your homework. There's um, a former agent out of Bronxville, New York, who runs a site called Publishers Marketplace and he also publishes a daily newsletter called Pub Lunch. Okay. You subscribe for $20 a month and you get access to a now I think, what, 10, 12 years worth of information, you can see what, who represents who, what they sold it for, who they sold it to, why, mm -hmm. all the, it, it's, it's the book equivalent of the movie database. Okay. All the information you ever needed to know, it's probably the best place to do your research. The only other thing to do, and this is much more laborious, is to go over to Barnes & Noble and look at the shelf you want to be on or writers that you emulate mm -hmm. and start reading the acknowledgments and see if you can figure it out. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really the, the lesser of the two ways. But Pub Lunch and Publishers Marketplace are absolutely positively so invaluable. Publunch.com? Actually, no, it's PublishersMarketplace.com. Okay, PublishersMarketplace.com. Okay, so you really need to find, figure out what your niche is and then find the, the agents that serve that niche. Right, exactly. And then, now I know, Ellen, when I talked to you prior to, to, to taping this, um, you talked about because you're nonfiction, mm -hmm. you needed to have a platform. Right. So for nonfiction writers, talk a little bit about what having a platform sure. means. Um, basically, when you're a nonfiction writer, you need to show whether it's an agent or an editor, whatever stage you're at, when you're trying to sell your idea, you need to show them that you have what, what is called a platform, which is basically the ability to reach your intended audience. Um, publishers don't have huge marketing budgets anymore, not unless you're some huge blockbuster author. Uh, authors are expected to do a lot of our own marketing. And in the nonfiction world, they basically want to know that there are already people out there who know who you are, who perceive you as an expert in whatever your area is. So a big part of the book proposal um, process is you put in your proposal, um, I speak at these conferences, mm -hmm. I write a blog that gets X number of page views per month, um, I write a column for such and such a magazine. So you're just showing that people already know my name, mm -hmm. so there are a certain number of people out there who will buy my book just because they know who I am. And um, I, I know it's different for fiction, mm -hmm. that there's not quite the emphasis on platform, but with nonfiction, they're basically, mo and I read a lot of um, 
in terms of resources, a lot of agents' blogs mm -hmm. and editors' blogs. There's tons of agents and editors that are blogging and writers too, mm -hmm. saying, giving you tricks of the trade. And, and you know, one thing everyone pretty much says is if you're going to write nonfiction and you don't have a platform, if you just have an idea, oh. but you've never done anything with that <laughs> idea, don't even bother. <laughs> don't bother because you won't get it. She anywhere. just rejected it. <laughs> she just rejected it. She doesn't even know what your idea is. So. No. Yeah. But I have to say, if I may compliment Ellen, she's got a heck of a platform. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, she really. So your platform, let's share for our viewers <laughs> who want to see your platform. Well, what I is have, your platform? Um, I have a couple different things going on. I have a, a website, ellenpainterdollar.com, mm -hmm. that's new. Um, through that website, you can reach my blog, which my blog is also new, but I've been blogging for several years. This mm -hmm. particular blog is a new, I'm blogging for a new place. But um, for several years, I've had my own blog, and mm -hmm. I've also written for some fairly big magazines um, online, all mm -hmm. online stuff, blogging, um, and just getting myself known as someone who knows about the topic that my book is about, uh, mostly online. Mostly much, online. Yeah. Okay. And so for fiction writers, mm -hmm. this is not an issue. This is so it's more you just your story has to be a good one and well written. Well, it, it's a little more. I think the decision is somewhat more based just on the strength of the manuscript because you never the agents are always kind of looking for the next big book club book. So mm -hmm. they're sometimes willing to take a chance on someone who may not have a tremendous platform, but just has a great idea that they think is going to connect with a lot of people. So um, I think you can be you can be less well known and get lucky in the fiction world, but not in the nonfiction world. Like I know that certainly to be true. Um, I find that I get a lot of information through Twitter. I follow a lot of um, I follow a lot of agents and editors and people in the book world. And they post uh, lots of great, you know, as you were saying, tips about writing. Um, you mm -hmm. get sort of a little bit of an inside look at the mm -hmm. agencies and, and what they're doing and how they're operating. Um, and I, I, Facebook, my own website, all those things, because every author now, as Ellen was saying, absolutely has to be their own best marketing manager. I mean, they have to be out there all the time promoting the, the book. Okay, so um, it sounds like you really, you just, you need to know your industry. You need to know, you just need to be really tapped in. And with the, all the social media mm -hmm. avenues, it's probably a little bit easier than it used to be because you oh, can absolutely. really absolutely. collect all that data. It, it's actually, I find it somewhat overwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost too much. <laughs> it's almost paralyzing? Like, like, yeah, it's well, you know, enough. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I, you know, I'll get the same note about something from seven different places and it's just it's a lot yeah. um, but um, you know particularly with fiction I mean in the end it has to be excellent right. it has to be absolutely positively excellent when I used to read fiction um, as an editor I read the first paragraph mm -hmm. and if it was awful you were done whoever buys your book mm -hmm may read the whole thing and be able to walk around the halls of their office and say, oh my gosh, this book changed my life. But every other person on the editorial board is way too busy to do that. They're going to all read the first paragraph. And right. if they don't like it, they're going to get the big thumbs down mm -hmm. at Edboard. Wow. And it, and it means something. I mean, I have friends who, you know, if your P&L at the end of the season is bad, it gets tossed on your desk and it's full of red ink, you're out of there. Right. So, so you really of, have to be confident that you can make right. a, a novel work. So that leads to, um, just quickly, and then I want you, you to share what your books are, are about, because I'm sure everybody's saying, well, what are these books about? Um, so once the book gets published, there's the marketing aspect of it, and, and of course, there's the financial aspect of it. So, so you've, you've beaten the odds, you've gotten published, and then, so do most authors, particularly first-time authors, is, is this what you're able to do as a living, or is this something that you do along with other ways to make a living? I mean, we just to be realistic, that's, so no. So you have to no. do other things as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I'll, I'm just at the beginning, authors, right. So, so, right? So who knows how? My goal is eventually to make enough money as a writer to pay for sort of the extras in my family's lives, mm -hmm. uh, the summer camp tuition, and you know right. the the new car, that kind of thing. I'm not there yet. Um, mm -hmm. And certainly for me as a nonfiction author, a book or even a few books is not going to get me there. My royalty yeah. arrangement with my publisher is actually very generous by industry standards, but I'm still only going to get a royalty check once a year, mm. and it's not going to be big. Right. Um, so 
my building a career involves finding paid blogging mm -hmm. um, gigs where I'm, I'm blogging once a month or once a week for someone and they're paying me to do it. Um, the, the place that hosts my blog now does pay me per page view. It's a pathetic amount of money, but they do pay me. <laughs> right. um, or you know, finding other ways to get paid for writing, not necessarily right. just the book royalties. And um, like I say, that's my goal is to be able to pay for those extras. I don't see myself getting there for another five or ten years, honestly. Yeah. So you really, so if you want to write a book, if you have that book idea, if you have even a manuscript, you you really need to be passionate about it. This is not something you can just Absolutely. do because it sounds cool mm -hmm. and you think it no. would be neat. You really need to love it and be dedicated to it, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Okay. Let's share what your books are about. So why don't we, Susan, sure. why don't you start with The Watershed Year? Okay. Hold up your book. I'll hold it up. <laughs> hold it up now. Here, I'll hold it and you talk. Thank you. And we can um, get a nice shot. A Watershed Year is the story of a woman who loses her dear friend to cancer um, and then has to pick up her life and eventually she goes to Russia and adopts a child and there's lots of complications that ensue after that. Um, but it's basically a love story and I try to um, tell people that I think it would appeal to a broad audience. It's probably considered more of a woman's book because you can see by the cover, <laughs> they definitely went that way in, mm -hmm. in marketing it. But um, I have been to lots and lots of book clubs, and I, I just went to one last night, and I've been to probably 20 in West Hartford in the last year. So it's been embraced by the book club community, which is amazing. And West Hartford is also, I have to say, a fantastic place to be an author because mm -hmm. there's so much support. Um, I'm just finding so many opportunities mm -hmm. to get out there and talk about it. Includes Christian. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. We're glad to have you. And Ellen, what about your book? Yours is on nonfiction I I memoir. I know. <laughs> we, we're going to put a slide in. So we're, we're right now we're looking okay. at your, um, your book cover. <laughs> it is partly a memoir. Um, I have a genetic bone disorder called osteogenesis imperfecta. It basically caused me to break a lot of bones. And it is genetic. And so when my husband and I knew we wanted to have kids, we had to deal with the fact that our children had a 50% chance of inheritance. My oldest daughter, who's now 12, um, inherited the, the disorder. Um, and so when we were thinking about having a second child, we decided to attempt something called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, which is basically in vitro fertilization with the added step of um, screening embryos for a genetic mutation, mm -hmm. in this case, my. Um, my OI mutation. That didn't work. I didn't get pregnant. We, for lots of reasons, we didn't do it again. I went on to have two more children um, just naturally, and neither of them got the disorder. But the whole decision-making process of, of figuring out whether or not to do um, pre-implantation diagnosis, or PGD as it's called, was really, it was a tough, tough um, decision. And we are people of faith, we are Christians, we found that um, we wanted to figure out what our faith might have to say to us about this mm -hmm. decision, and there was nothing out there for us. Um, everything was very academic or very theological or very sort of high-minded, it wasn't very practical. Certainly our fertility clinic wasn't that interested in exploring um, that side of things. So I basically wrote the book I wish we had had um, back okay. then. So it's partly a memoir, partly just tells my story, my daughter's story, and our story right. of these decisions. And then it goes into the various moral and ethical questions raised by reproductive technologies and kind of discusses them in a way that will be accessible to regular people who need to make these decisions. I can't wait to read it. Oh, thank you. I've been you following too. your blog, so I have a, a little bit of an insight into it. Um, so you had talked a little bit about support networks for writers. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that we, we get those concepts out there too. So Lisa, you talked about the Publishers Marketplace mm -hmm. website. So what about, do you have like people that you share the book with that re help you edit it, read it, give you ideas? Is that more of a fiction phenomenon than nonfiction? And in West Hartford, what might those resources be? Um, I have gone through various stages where I really wanted to share and mm -hmm. workshop the book and get feedback and then other stages where I decided that was like the worst thing I could do. <laughs> right. I, I, I was getting confused by critiques and, right. and not sure about it. So, But there are so many resources. Um, the West Hartford Library has some great programs for writers. They, um, the Mark Twain House 
is doing some phenomenal things. In the last year, they've really picked up their mm -hmm. support for writers programs. So I'm actually going to be doing a workshop there in March for uh, people who are interested in writing a novel. They're going to be having a big um, uh, writers workshop in April as well to bringing in mm -hmm. nationally known people. So that's a great place to look into. Um, I also go online, and we all you know, have our little favorite spots. I, I belong to a, a forum called Backspace, which is, you know, you could Google it very easily. And it's a remarkable resource. I wish I had known about it before I went through the mm -hmm. whole Asian hunting process, because it's one of these places where there's really a community of writers of all kinds, nonfiction and fiction. Mm -hmm. And, there's, and there are categories where people talk about different um, things that are happening in where they are in their careers. So it ranges everything from people just starting out, like haven't even sent out their first short story, to people who are at the top of the game. Um, Sarah Grun, who's on, who wrote Water for Elephants, is on. Oh, you know, wow. She chimes in every now and again. Oh, that's so, so there are yeah. all, you know, that's like a, a, an amazing place right. to find those kind of resources. And, you know, other writers, we just all support each other. Right. And people will now come up to me and say, I know I've had an idea for a novel mm -hmm. and I never really explored it. And, you know, I'd love to just sit down with help. people and talk about it because a lot of people helped me during the, the right. process, too. Do you have any last words of advice before we run out of time from the industry perspective? <laughs> <laughs> um, make sure either your proposal or your finished manuscript really is finished. Take advantage of these supports that these guys are talking about mm -hmm. because you really have such a short window mm -hmm. to grab somebody's attention um, right. that you really have to make sure that it is absolutely positively as perfect as you can make it and sharing it in the end is, is a good way to do that. To get that feedback, mm -hmm. that's great. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you all joining me and sharing your relatively new book and your brand spanking new book. I can't wait to get it in my hands. You've been watching Life and Style with Sarah. If you want to learn more about Ellen's book, you can go to www.ellenpainterdollar.com. If you want to learn more about Susan's book, A Watershed Year, you can go to www.susanschoenberger.com. And hopefully we've inspired you to get Get writing and to find an agent and get your great next American novel published. <laughs> Thanks for watching and tune in next month for a brand new episode of Life and Style with Sarah.